Hey everyone, my name is Pastor Matt. I'm the lead pastor here at The River, and we're excited that you're listening to our podcast. Our vision here at The River is that you would find both family and purpose. So here's this week's message. We hope it encourages you, we hope it inspires you, and we hope that you know that God has a plan for your life. Enjoy the message. Good morning, everybody. We are so pumped that you are here with us. I don't get to comment what I miss the most about not getting to be together. So I'm just going to tell you, I miss you guys. I miss this room being full of people and us getting to worship Jesus, chase Jesus, sing praises to Jesus, declare the word of Jesus, declare the word of God together, which gets me super excited about next weekend. This is our last digital only service, right? Next weekend, the doors are opening up. We're going to have three services, 9 to 10 a.m., 10.30 to 11.30 uh, a.m., and then 12 to 1. So I just want you to know, we miss you. We are ready to chase Jesus with you, and we are so pumped for next week. Now, I say that we are also excited about this week, right? We don't want to be looking so uh, so far forward that we miss out on what God wants to do today. And so today, we're going to conclude our series that we've been in called The Handoff. Now, when we started this series, we kind of used the analogy of track, right? I like uh, track. This is about the time of the year that the track season would be ending. And my favorite thing about track was the relays. Now, the most important part of a relay are the exchanges or the handoffs. A good exchange could help you win the race, but a bad exchange could cause you to lose it. And the reason that we're in this series is we're asking this question. Are the things that we're passing down to the next generation the most important things? Like, is the things that we're telling them that are the most valuable good for them so that when it's their turn to carry the faith, that they will run and succeed, that they will go further, that they will go faster, and they will do more than we did? Right? Week one, we talked about it is our responsibility to pass down our faith, right? We looked at the story where they crossed through the Jordan River and they were carrying their stones. They were carrying their testimony. And it says that their kids would ask about their testimony. When's the last time you told your kids how you experienced Jesus, how Jesus set you free from sin and death? I, I, I love that I use this statement. I want to bring it up again. Is It's not my job as Bradley's pastor to tell Bradley about Jesus. It is first my job as Bradley's father to make sure that he knows about Jesus. It is your responsibility to pass down your faith. Week two, we talked about it's our responsibility to model it. It's our responsibility to show them how to live, right? We looked at the scripture in Proverbs where it says, direct a child onto the right path. Or another translation says, train them up in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. It's not enough to just tell them, right? It is our job to show them. It is our job to model it. It is our job to participate with them. I like how Charles Spurgeon said it. He said, direct your child or train your child up in the way that they should go, but be sure you're going that way as well. So this Sunday is Senior Sunday. If you have a graduating senior, listen, seniors, we celebrate you. We are so excited for what you've accomplished, and we're excited to see what you do in the future. And I think the text that we're looking at today is perfect for this transition, right? So if you've got a Bible, open it up to 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you don't, the words will pop up on the screen, or you can follow along with our notes in our app. So just a little bit of background information. This letter was written by Paul to Timothy. It's the first of two letters that he'll write. So let's kind of talk about their relationship. Timothy and Paul were really close. In fact, Timothy served underneath Paul, uh, more specifically in his second missionary journey, right? And they were so close that Timothy was almost like a son to Paul, right? Timothy learned from him. He followed him, and Paul would eventually plant a church in Ephesus, and he would leave Timothy to oversee this church. So when we look at this scripture, I want you to imagine it. From, uh, imagine, th imagine that it's written from a father's perspective. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, it says this. It says, don't let anyone despise your youth. Another translation says, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, give your attention to the public reading, and ex uh, public reading, exhortation, and teaching, and don't neglect the gift that is in you. It was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. See, if this is Senior Sunday for you, parents, you realize that this is the final 
stretch. Turn to your neighbor or comment below that this is the final stretch. Let's pray. So dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for this time where we can just come and dive into your word, where we can worship you and praise you, God. And we are so excited uh, for the, the provision that you're providing that next week we can meet in, per, in person. God, we speak against the spirit of fear. God, we speak against the spirit of shame and we just declare your goodness all over the earth. God, we love you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. So I want to start off by making a statement. Usually I start off by asking you a question. I just want to tell you something that you probably already know. Um, and it's this, validation is a powerful tool. Validation is a powerful tool. And if you're unaware of what I'm saying, I'm saying like to validate something is to declare something or someone as worthy or as good enough, right? Now, let me let you into my story a little bit. You know, I've gotten to share um, a little bit of my parenting history, but when I found out that I was going to be a dad, I was super excited. Like, I was super pumped. Alexis uh, met me at Palace Coffee, and the way that she told me was uh, she had written it out on a baseball. She tossed me a glove and a baseball, and it says, you're about to be a dad. And I was super pumped. I ran into Palace Coffee because I was meeting with some friends, and I showed them the baseball. But the other side of the coin is I was also terrified. I was also extremely nervous about becoming a dad. See, growing up, like I knew I wanted to be a pastor. That was something I knew God had called me to, especially uh, my sophomore year of high school. But I had two major goals in life. My goals were I wanted to be a good husband and I wanted to be a good father, right? So for this, when she had given me this baseball, it was like this was actually becoming an opportunity and I was super, super excited. But again, I was super nervous. Here's the reason why I was nervous. I'm not used to babies. Like I was used to teenagers and adults. I say kids and big kids, right? I'm used to people that are potty trained and that can communicate well. I had never held a baby, much less change a baby's diaper before Bradley. In fact, when Alexis was pregnant, we were um, at my in-law's house and my brother-in-law has a twin brother and he, they had just had a baby. So Alexis hands me this baby, his name is Colt, and she says, hey, you need to practice. For like the first five seconds, everything was good. And then all of a sudden, the baby started moving. And I panicked, and I handed him quickly to Alexis. I was like, babe, I don't know what he's doing. And she looked at me. She goes, Matt, he's just stretching. And I told her, I was like, I don't, I'm pretty sure babies don't do that. Like, I don't, I don't think babies stretch. It's just not what they do. I, I never changed a diaper, my wife basically set me up to fail in that experience, right? So in this time of waiting for Bradley to get here, I was nervous. And I, uh, I decided to, to find a book. I was going to look for a book to help me out, to help me get some confidence. And I stumbled upon a book by John Eldridge called You Have What It Takes, right? Mentally going into that book, I'm like, I'm not. But I hope by the end of this book, I really have what it takes. And I learned a lot from this book. In fact, it taught me this. It taught me that children learn nurture from their, from their mothers, right? And I see this with Bradley. The other day, Bradley skid his toe and he's crying and Alexis runs and she checks on him and she like holds him and, and he's okay. And my initial response is like, hey, if you stop crying, it won't hurt as bad because the blood flow won't rush to that spot. And so like, that's my response. Like Alexis does a really good job of nurturing. I'm sure you can think about growing up and how your mom always held you and checked on you when things were tough. But fathers... The role of fathers is validation, right? They're, to answer this question, boys basically want to know, like, am I manly enough? Am I tough enough? And girls want to know, like, am I pretty enough? Am I lovely enough? In fact, we actually see this in Scripture. When Jesus was baptized, it says that the heavens split open and God the Father said, this is my son of whom I'm well pleased. God validated Jesus. And if God, as the Father, had to validate the Savior of the world, how much more do we as fathers need to validate our kids? But here's the thing is, I don't think validation runs out. And this is what I mean. I think we need to be validated in all stages of life. I think we all need someone to believe in us. I think we all need someone to remind us of what's inside of us. And I wanna ask the question, who's that person for you? Who's that person that, that just speaks life into you? Uh, I, to start off, just to give a couple, my wife is one. 
Alexis speaks so much life into me, and, and she's got a, I told her I was going to share this story, but I always ask Alexis for feedback on Sunday mornings, right? If there's anybody that's going to be completely honest with me and tell me if I did a really bad job, it's going to be my wife. She loves me. She's going to be honest with me. So the other day I walked in after preaching a sermon. I said, well, babe, what'd you think? And she goes, Matt, your outfit was on point. And I was like, okay, so uh, what do you think about the message? She goes, oh, that was good too. I was like, uh, I guess it wasn't necessarily that great. But my wife, she speaks so much life into me. Uh, Pastor Mike here at the office is one of the most encouraging people that I know. Um, Pastor Mike uh, will, will speak life into everybody. But what, also what I love about Pastor Mike and something that I think we need to understand about validation is Pastor Mike will give me feedback on things that I can work on to grow. Right. Validation. Like it, it, this, that's why I say it's it's people to remind us of what's inside of us. There is something inside of you and there are people that see that. And when they give you feedback, listen, you're, maybe your initial response is to get offended. That's the wrong response. People give you feedback because they want to grow you. Right. Pastor Mike is somebody that speaks life into me. Pastor Matt Johnson at the loft um, has always somebody been somebody that uh, that speaks life into me when I'm going through a hard time. And he's always been somebody to call out a gift that he's seen inside of me. Maybe. And he even views it from a different perspective than I do. Um, but he's always somebody that spoke life in me. Luke and Tori Durst, they've always dreamed alongside of us in, in, in the tough times and in the bad. They've always, in fact, there's been a time where I spoke some death over my life and, and Tori has stopped me and said, don't you say that. Don't you speak that over you. You need those people in your life. And the last one is my parents. My parents have always let me know how proud of me that they are. And I think that's what Paul is doing for Timothy in this Situation, Because see, what we know about Timothy is Timothy was somebody with great character. Otherwise, he wouldn't be leading this church in Ephesus. And here's what you need to know about Ephesus. Ephesus wasn't this small place. Ephesus, they believe, had 250,000 people in this location, right? And they also think that Timothy's church was one of the first mega churches. And he was 30 to 35 years old approximately when he received this letter. So there's probably people in his congregation that feel like they've done life more or they have more life experience and he's probably doubting himself, right? We know that there are a couple times that Timothy gives in to fear. There's a couple times that he, that he shows a, t- a timid spirit and I believe that when Paul writes this, he's saying, listen, if I didn't think you could do it, I wouldn't have left you in that spot in the first place. And, and maybe that's a word for you today. Maybe you're in this place and you're struggling and there's a battle going on and I'm, t- I'm here to tell you that if God didn't think that you could do it, he wouldn't have put you there in the first place. He wouldn't have surrounded you with those people in the first place. You are where God wants you to be in this season. And he's giving you the tools to get through it. But as a spiritual father, Paul says this. Let's look at verse 12 again. He says, don't let anyone despise you or despise your youth, but set an example for believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and in purity. I love this. He says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. He is writing to Timothy and he says, listen, your age does not disqualify you. Right? Your age does not disqualify you. I want to tell you something. God does not see you dependent on age. He sees you dependent on your faith and your willingness. Right? That's what qualifies you. He doesn't look at you and say, listen, you're not uh, 16, so you can't do this just yet. He wants, he's looking for people that are like, God, it doesn't matter what you say, I'm willing to do it. It doesn't matter what the circumstances, God, I'm willing to follow you. Because what I've seen is I've seen so many young people that are more willing than older generations. Because sometimes what happens with with us when we get older is this is just the way that I was brought up. We're unwilling to shift and unwilling to change because, hold on, this is one familiar in churches. That's just the way that we've always done it, right? And sometimes seasons change. We recognize that seasons change In our lives, we also need to understand that seasons change in how we chase after people. Our job is to go after every generation, right? Our goal as the river is to go after every generation, from from those that are babies to those that are the oldest as, as young old. We'll just say young old. I don't want older people to get mad at me, right? So, but I want you to to remember something. You remember when when Samuel was looking for the next king, like Saul was uh, leading and he had sinned against God and God was looking for the next king and he's, he's going to look for David. He, he goes to all of David's brothers and he sees them and he sees the first one who looks like a king. He's big, he's tall, he's strong. 
And God told him, he said, this is the one. And he said this, he said this statement. He says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And here's a question I want to ask. Is it possible that we don't see people the way that God sees them because we don't measure them the way that God measures people? Like, is it possible that we actually don't think people are qualified because we look at them from a human perspective instead of using God's measuring stick to see people? Because what I want to tell you is like, this is in our church. We have a photography team in our church. The oldest person and the person that leads that is a sophomore in high school. She's the one that schedules it. She's the one that plans it. And she's the one that makes sure that they're there to, to take the photographs so that we could use photography as ministry. We've had teenagers serve on our greeting team. And can you imagine what it would be like if we said, listen, God can't use you because you're not out of high school yet. Where's that in the scripture? Show me where that's at in the Bible. In fact, I think if you read scripture, you'll see that all throughout scripture, God has used young people. God has used young people throughout the Bible. In fact, there's a king who was the king of Judah. His name was Josiah. He became king at eight years old. You're like, well, that was just because he was the son of the king. No, look at what he did. By the age of 20, he had destroyed all the idol worship that his father and his grandfather had set up. His father and his grandfather spent 57 years setting up idol worship in all of Judah. And in 12 years, he had it destroyed and had Judah going back after Jesus. But he was a young person, David. David was bypassed by his own father because he didn't look the part, because his outward appearance didn't look kingly. And then when Saul was supposed to fight uh, Goliath, David shows up and Saul even disqualified him. He said, listen, you're a boy. You're young. You don't have the experience. He's been a man of war since his youth. But God said he was a man after God's own heart. Jeremiah. Jeremiah was anointed as a prophet, as a teenager. He was God's voice to the world. You're like, man, all of those are Old Testament references. You know, that's old school. Okay. Mary. The, save, the, the mother of the Savior of the world. Birthed Jesus. She was a teenager when she was pregnant with Jesus. She was a teenager when she gave birth to the Savior of the world. God has used young people throughout, throughout Scripture. Listen, if you are a senior and you're about to graduate and go into college, listen, be prepared for God to use you. God has used young people throughout history. And maybe you're sitting there and you're like, Matt, I get it. But what if they're just not ready yet? I think that's a very good question. I think it's a very valid question. But I want to answer your question with my question. So how did Paul prepare Timothy to lead the church at Ephesus? He took him with him. He took him with him. He invested in him. He grew him. And I think that we need to remember that a key ingredient when it comes to investing in people is a relationship. Face to face, not behind a screen. We need to get face to face with our kids. We need to get face to face with the next generation and invest in them and to pour into them, right? If we're our goal, our mission as the river is to make disciples, if we're going to do that, we've got to build relationships. We've got to get face to face and we've got to start taking people with us. Then look what he says. He says, don't let anybody look down on you for your youth but set an example for believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So right after he tells them, he says, hey, don't let anybody look down on you. This was how you're supposed to combat that. Set an example. If people disqualify you for your youth, this is how you change their mind. You set an example. How? By the way that you live. In speech, and conduct, those are outward expressions. In love, faith, and purity, that's what's taking place inside. He says, watch how you speak. Watch how you respond, right? If they think that you're immature, respond in mature ways. Talk in mature ways. And let love and purity and faith continue to grow inside of you. And I'm here to tell you, if, you, if somebody has looked down on you because you're young, or if they've tried to disqualify you, prove them wrong by the way that you live. Prove them wrong by the way that you live. Don't just go and tell them what's up, right? There was one time I remember, this wasn't, this is extra. This wasn't in my notes. I remember there was this one time I had gotten this girl's phone number when I was younger and I called her, um, I think I was in like sixth grade and her mom said, listen, she's not allowed to talk to little boys. You know how mad I got? I was like, little boys? Like I mowed the yard, right? Like I play the saxophone. Like I'm not no little boy. Right? <laughs> That's mentally what's going on in my mind. 
The right way to respond would be to show her, to live it, right? To show them who you are. In fact, that reminds me of one of my favorite movie quotes. I love Marvel movies, right? I love the Black Panther and King T'Challa. He's supposed to go back and, and, he's, and their ritual is like, you can fight to be the king, right? You, whoever wins this battle gets to be the Black Panther. They get the, the gift, all that stuff. Well, he goes and there, nobody's gonna contest him until this guy shows up and his name's Umbaku. He shows up and he tells him all these reasons why he's not fit to be king. You're too young. Your your uh, our technological advances are being led by a young person. You're just not qualified. And in the middle of the battle, it looks like he's about to lose. And his mom yells this, and it, I mean, it brought me to tears. She says, "Show them who you are. Show them who you are." I said this on Wednesday when I got to talk to the graduating seniors. The world or Jesus is waiting for the real you to show up. God did not make you on accident. He created you to be a game changer and God wants to move through you, right? But you gotta show them, you gotta be an example. Now, how could Timothy be a good example? It's because he had one. He had a good example. That he had somebody that went before him. He had Paul. Paul was a great example for him. Now, remember last week I said, we have to show them how to live. It's our responsibility to show the next generation what following Jesus looks like. And Paul had done that. In fact, it was Paul that would tell his church leaders, follow me as I follow Christ. He was the great example. And something I want you to think about is that the next generation could be a great example because we were a great example for them. The next generation could go do more because we were a great example for them. So I love this. He said, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. In fact, the way that you change their perspective, the way that you change the way that they think about you is you show them how you live. Show them how you live. So I'm gonna, we're gonna get ready to close. I'm gonna ask Ben to come up and play the keys and we're gonna look at verse 14. He said this, he says, don't neglect the gift that is in you. It was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. And I love this because Paul didn't just see Timothy's gift, right? And, I, and usually on Senior Sunday, what would happen is we would have the seniors come up and all of our elders would come up and lay hands on them and pray, on, pray over them as they would get ready to go out in the world. And we would, we would believe in that. We believe that, the, that our graduating seniors have a gift inside of them, that God wants to use them, that they're not accidents, that they have a purpose. And Paul's doing that. He says, hey, I know you had a gift. I know you have a gift. And what I loved is that after Timothy became a church leader and Paul was continually doing mission work, he never forgot his gift. In fact, he pointed him back to it. In fact, he would do it again. In 2 Timothy, Timothy's afraid. Paul's about to die. It's his last letter that he, that he will write. And he tells Timothy this. He says, rekindle your gift. Use your gift. How do we get over being afraid? Man, we go back to using the thing that God has put inside of us. When people are looking down on you, when people have disqualified you, don't neglect your gift. Don't put it away. Don't forget about it. That's the thing that will change people's perspective. That thing, if you will be an example, use your gift. Let them see God inside of you. See, one of the easiest ways to validate the next generation is for us to see the gift that's inside of them. But one of the hardest things for us as parents is for us not to declare the one that we want them to have. We need to see what God sees, not what we want them to see or what we want to see. Because your gifting may be different than your kids, right? And here's the truth. We may be their parents, but we are not their creator. God may have given them to us as a gift, but we did not create them. God is the one that made them. God is the one that, that has the plan of their life before his hands. Like he's ready to look at it. Psalms 139 says, and we need to remember that. We are not their creator. We are their parents. In fact, they're a temporary task in our life. It's our job to prepare them, to sharpen them. And this is what I love. When it comes to the next generation, you know, many times we think about like, the sword of the spirit, which is the word, right? We think about fighting the devil with a sword or protecting ourselves with the shield of faith. But you understand that the Bible refers to your kids as arrows? Do you understand that maybe the greatest offensive weapon 
against the devil is raising up godly kids. It's passing down your faith. It's showing them how to live. And it's speaking to the gift that God has put inside of them. And when you do that, and it comes senior Sunday someday, or they leave to go join the military, or whatever it is, and you release them out into the world, you are actually releasing a deadly weapon against the enemy. Because your children are arrows. But Matt, what if they're not like me? That's okay. My dad, me and my dad, we're very different. My dad can lay tile. My dad can build things. They have a three-car garage that my dad built. My dad is a guard at Pantex. He, that's just what he does. And when you look at me, I'm none of those things. I like computers. I like photography. I like videography. I speak for a living. I get to talk. I get to love on people. That's what I get to do. Does that mean that my dad failed? No. Does it? Because my dad saw my gifting and he encouraged me in those areas. Listen, our job as parents is not to, to tell our kids who to be. It's to speak into what God's already spoke over them. It's to validate them in those areas because someday our kids are going to leave our house. Someday they're going to go to college. Someday they're going to get married. They're going to have their own kids. And we're going to have the same opportunity to do what Paul did for Timothy. We're going to have the opportunity to tell them, listen, doesn't matter what the world says. Don't let anybody look down on you. Don't let anybody look down on you. Instead, be an example. Show them that you're qualified. Show them who you are. And remember that thing that God's put inside of you. Don't let go of it. Never let go of that. And this is what I believe. I believe when we pass down our faith, when we share our stories, and we show them how to live, and we model it, and we let them know that we believe in them, that we are equipping them with the eternal, the eternal tools to run the race well. I believe if we'll do those things, we'll launch the most deadly assault against the enemy and anything that he wants to do. But it's our job to make sure we're passing down the right things. And if we'll do that, they'll run faster, they'll go further, and they'll do more than we could ever have. And that's okay, because remember, faith is a multiplication thing. We want to multiply them. We want to give them permission to do double. So today is Senior Sunday. And for some of you parents, today is the final stretch. In the next two to three months, your kids will maybe be joining the military. Maybe they'll be going off to college and, and it's a bittersweet thing. And I just want to tell you, you've done the job. You were the right parent. You were the right person. God chose you for a reason. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. There's a couple things that we'd love for you to do. We would love for you to like it, subscribe, and to share it. If this ministry has blessed you and you would like to give to it, a couple ways that you could do that is through our app or through our website, www.theriverpanhandle.com. Have a great week.